evolutionists have stumbled upon one of the first testable conclusions made by creationism. The genome of all human beings can be traced back to a single woman that scientists call mitochondrial Eve. Creationists could have told them that if they'd only asked. The problem is that evolutionists always get the dates wrong. They claim that she lived somewhere between 100 and 230,000 years ago. Again, they should ask creationists so they can get a more accurate, more precise, and more recent date of about 6,000 years ago. It'll save them some embarrassment in the end. This is one time when evolutionists can't deny that creationists already knew what they'd find. How could I not investigate? Within the cells of nearly all eukaryotic life are small organelles known as mitochondria. Mitochondria are known as the powerhouses of the cell because their primary function appears to be the production of the cell's main energy source, adenosine triphosphate, also known as ATP. The mitochondrion has its own DNA separate from the nucleus and divides via binary fission within the cell. Because they reproduce asexually, they are not subject to the recombination of genes that occurs with nuclear DNA during sexual reproduction. The part of the sperm cell which requires energy is the tail, so that's where the majority of the mitochondria are located. Typically at fertilization, the tail breaks off, so very few male mitochondria end up in the egg. The egg cell contains enzymes which break down the sperm cell to release its nuclear DNA. These enzymes see the male mitochondria as foreign bodies and break them down as well. Because of all of this, in humans, mitochondria is passed on virtually 100% of the time from the mother. There is only one known case of a human being inheriting their mitochondrial DNA from their father. It was reported on August 22nd of 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine. The patient was a 28-year-old man with severe, lifelong exercise intolerance. He had never been able to run more than a few steps. After examining samples of blood, hair, and other tissues, it was discovered that the young man had inherited his father's mitochondria and, even though they had survived fertilization, the mitochondrial DNA had been damaged in the process, which interrupted the ability for his mitochondria to produce adequate energy for muscle exertion. Devoid of modern society's conveniences, this condition would render the patient unlikely to reproduce. So scientists can confidently trace all humans back through their matrilineal line to one single woman, just like creationism and evolution both predict. But this is where the common predictions between the two theories end. The out of Africa scenario for human origins predicts that this common ancestor would have lived somewhere in Africa. At first, one would assume that creationism's prediction is that mitochondrial Eve would have lived near the Tigris and Euphrates, as the book of Genesis clearly describes the Garden of Eden being located in that vicinity. The problem with this prediction is that it is based on a misunderstanding of what mitochondrial Eve actually is. Mitochondrial Eve is not proposed to be the first woman, nor was she the only woman living at the time. She is proposed to be the most recent common female ancestor. If we were to actually identify the individual theorized to be mitochondrial Eve, as populations change over time, that woman's identity would also change. To give a greatly exaggerated example of this, if the population of the Earth were to be wiped out except for you and a cousin who is the child of your mom's sister, there would be a radically new mitochondrial Eve. Her identity would be your grandmother on your mother's side. She would be the most recent common ancestor between the two of you, the entirety of the human race. Even according to a strict biblical reading, the chances are that mitochondrial Eve would not be Eve, but one of her descendants. More accurately, the most recent common female ancestor would have been someone who lived either just before or just after the biblical flood, when the population had been reduced to only eight individuals. Perhaps she could have even been Noah's wife herself. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't actually reveal where Noah lived before the flood, but we can reasonably say that, if creationism were accurate, mitochondrial Eve would have lived somewhere in or near the Persian Gulf, being reasonably near the Tigris and Euphrates while also being close to the mountains of Ararat. In April of 1979, Alan Wilson of the University of California 
California, Berkeley, and postdoctoral student Wesley Brown published work in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which demonstrated a rapid mutation rate in human mitochondrial DNA. Wilson and Brown observed that mitochondrial DNA mutated between 5 and 10 times faster than nuclear DNA at a rate of about 0.02 substitution per base pair per million years. As opposed to the billions of base pairs in nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA contains only 16,600 base pairs, which makes gene mapping much simpler. They concluded that this rate of mutation would be a useful tool in determining details about human diversity. Also in 1979, Wilson and doctoral student Rebecca Kahn began collecting samples from over 100 women of separate ethnic groups. After examining their mitochondrial DNA, in 1983, they had still failed to conclusively find a common ancestor. However, in the process, graduate student Mark Stone King joined Wilson's lab for his PhD and aggressively sought out more and more samples, especially Aboriginal Australians, New Guineans, and Africans. The team realized that specific mutations shared at the same locations between individuals indicated matrilineal relationship, which Antonio Toroni of the University of Pavia would later dub a haplogroup. Within one haplogroup, there are even smaller groups which share another mutation. The mutations in the smaller groups are not shared by individuals in other haplogroups. Knowing this, a family tree for haplogroups can be drawn. Wilson and Can found that the highest haplogroup diversity in the world is in sub-Saharan Africa. Each of these haplogroups is as genetically distinct as the haplogroups from Europe, Asia, and the Americans. This indicates an early diversification. This distinction occurred due to little or no interbreeding between individuals belonging to separate haplogroups. It would be unrealistic to assume that all of those diverse ethnic African haplogroups would originate near the Persian Gulf or Southeast Asia, diverge from each other, and then migrate together without interbreeding to Sub-Saharan Africa. The more likely scenario is that the vast majority of the early descendants of mitochondrial Eve originated in sub-Saharan Africa and stayed there while smaller groups subsequently migrated and became ancestors of ethnic groups outside of Africa. The results were published for peer review on January 1st, 1987 in the peer-reviewed journal Nature. So we can confidently say, with very little fear of refutation, that mitochondrial Eve lived in sub-Saharan Africa. Between creationists and evolutionists, the big question is not where she lived, but when she lived. As I've already mentioned, the evolutionary estimate is between 100 and 230,000 years ago, while the creationist estimate should be between 4,000 and 6,000 years ago. The genetics give us one very specific estimate. Between the most distantly isolated haplogroups, the team noticed a total difference of 121 base pair substitutions, taking into account the fairly steady established rate of 0.02 substitutions per base pair over 1 million years across 16,000 base pairs, and assuming that both haplogroups continue to diverge at the same estimated rate, we come to a figure of roughly 180,000 years, well within the evolutionary estimate. For the creationist estimate to be correct, the rate of mutation in the past would have had to be 30 to 45 times faster than its present rate. So the creationist assumption that all people share a single female ancestor is correct, but with the discovery of mitochondrial DNA, that very same confirmed creation creationist assumption demonstrates that creationism gets the place and time of that common ancestor dead wrong. And that's how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.